In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. It's interesting to look at the concept of truth because it means very different things to different people. And if you look at truth, you realize that the world tells us now that everything is relative. That whatever truth you are seeking, whatever truth you are looking for, it depends on something else. It depends on another set of circumstances and can therefore change between you and me or each one of you in your own situation. And I suppose that is true in some elements. In some elements of life, my assessment can be different to yours, can be different to yours, can be different to each person's. And that will depend on where I am in life, what I'm going through, how I'm living my life, the experiences I have, and so on and so forth. But for some things, there is no relativity. For some things, there is an absolute. If I hold this cross, and if I leave my hand, will it fall? Yes. That's, it's a given. It's a fact. Are we born and then do we die? It's a fact. Are there certain things about us, in terms of our humanity, that are subject to this world? Yes, it's a fact. So there are facts. One of those facts is our origin. Where are we from? How were we created? Why were we created? By whom we were created? And if we don't see ourselves in the right way, within the right perspective, and existing for the right reasons, we are going to make very, very wrong decisions. Of course, when we talk about truth, we're not talking about life, the universe, and everything here. I'm assuming that if you're here at this retreat and you're listening to me, and our, question, our, our topic is questions to God, then we're talking about truth of him and his existence, who he is in our lives. And it is only in really having faith in him that that truth is revealed. It's only in knowing him and being subject to him and dealing with him and relating to him. It is only in being the person we are because of him that that truth is revealed. Because in 1 Peter 5.10, we are told very, very clearly, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. We believe in him, and therefore we get all of these other verses that he is the truth and the truth sets us free. It sets us free of doubt. It sets us free of uncertainty. If he is the truth, which he is, then that puts our whole life into a very different perspective. When our, when, when our Lord spoke to his disciples and revealed his plan to them, they said to him, See, now you speak all things. We know who you are, and there is no reason for anyone to doubt you. And that's such an important thing for us. Once God reveals himself, once we accept this revelation, once we know him for who he is, life is in a very different perspective. Not knowing that truth puts us in all types of trouble. Because not knowing the truth of him will cast doubts on him and on ourselves. First of all, 
if we don't have the truth about him and we don't accept it and we don't internalize it, then we'll doubt him. Does he really love me? Why is he, why is he abandoning me now? Why aren't I receiving what I want? And at this stage of your lives, there are many things you want. Some you will have already received, others not yet. Others you may never receive at all. And so, if I believe in a God and I'm dealing with a God whom I, am, whom I know to be true, then what I have received, what I'm still waiting for, and what I may never receive will not change my perception of him. Because I know he's faithful, he's loving, and that he doesn't change. There is a consistency in God. I said this earlier and I will say it again and again and again. If we have felt God's hand in our lives once, if we have felt him moving our lives once, then he'll continue to do it. Because God doesn't change. God is consistent. And we're, we're often talking about wanting to know the truth and wanting to know his wisdom on things and his direction. And we say that there is a silence. There is a silence. What we need to realize is that sometimes that silence is a message in itself. Either I will answer you later, or, I will answer you in a different way, or what is even more likely is I've already told you a million times, why do you keep asking me? My answer is not going to change. You've asked me once, twice, three times, a million times, and I keep saying the same thing to you. So, so why do you keep asking? Why do you not see the answer in yourself? Why do you not understand that I love you? Why do you not understand that I have put you where you are and made you who you are and love you as you are and I will always provide for you to the best of my ability for you to be the best person you are? So if we don't know that, we doubt God. And then sometimes one step further is we doubt ourselves. If it's not, why is God not responding to me? Is he not really there? It becomes, am I not worth responding to? Am I not lovable enough? Am I not worthy of his care? Am I not worthy of his blessing in my life? Have I done something wrong? And none of that is the truth. The truth is this. God made us because he loves us. He keeps us because he loves us. There are always going to be things we want in our lives. There are always going to be struggles we face in our lives. And the fact that I don't receive everything I want, or that I cannot overcome every struggle I face, does not mean that God doesn't love me or care about me. It just means that that's the way life is sometimes. I need to be patient and I need to be confident in him. Gospel of St. John chapter 18. In the meeting of Pilate with our Lord. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. It's one of these questions that we sometimes ask. Are you a king? Yeah, you said it. I'm a king. We can put ourselves in the same situation. Thankfully, we're not trying God. But we, we sometimes put him on trial, very much the same way 
as Pontius Pilate did. Although Pilate is some t would have been, in some contexts, more sympathetic and understanding than we are. Because he almost was looking for an excuse to, to, to let him off the hook. He kept going back to his people saying, he's done nothing. Why do you keep bringing him back to me? So we sometimes place ourselves in that situation of putting God on trial. But instead of saying, are you a king then? We turn around and say, are you really God? And by that we mean, are you really omnipotent? Do you really have all power in your hands? Are you really able to resolve all things for me? Are you really able to address my needs, my fears, my concerns? Are you really able to carry me through this? And our Lord says to us, you rightly say that I am God. And not only God, but God who took flesh and came into your world for you. Why else? Why else would God take flesh and do that? For us. For us. For each and every one of us. For this reason I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And sometimes maybe that's why we don't hear him. That's why sometimes we think he's not responding to me. Because we're not of the truth. We don't believe in him as the truth. We don't live our lives as of the truth. We're speaking a different language. We're, we're functioning in a different frequency altogether. So to hear God's voice, you have to be at this frequency here. But the way I'm living, because it's not the truth, I'm functioning at a far lesser frequency. So he's still speaking, but I can't hear him because my life is in a very different place. And until I'm able to lift my life, you see, we are so often trying to bring God down to us so we can understand him. But he's already done that. He's already done that. He's already proclaimed himself as our God when he took flesh and he came down and dwelt with us. He showed us the truth of his divinity and his love for us and his ultimate sacrifice. So rather than constantly bringing him down to our frequency, it's time for us to try to rise to his. And what I mean by that is my life my thoughts, my actions, my choices. How do I live? What do I expect of myself? We sometimes stunt our own growth. We stunt our own growth by not reaching high enough, by not reaching that frequency. And we stunt our own growth by just thinking that we can't do any better. But the truth is that we can. So our Lord says, Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, Pilate's automatic question is ours. Pilate said to him, what is the truth? What is the truth? The truth is simple. The truth is, as I said, God created us. We fell. God took flesh and came to us as the incarnate word to save us. Born, crucified, buried, risen, ascended, waiting for us. In a nutshell, that is the truth. 
There are lots of facts in the middle. There are lots of situations, lots of stories, lots of life experiences, a long journey. But that is the truth. Do I live as one created by God because he loves me? Do I love myself the way he loves me? Do I understand him and understand the ultimate sacrifice that he presented, not only in dying on the cross, just the sacrifice of the incarnation? And one thing I always try to remind people of is that if our Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate, was born into the most palatial family, in the most palatial setting, it still would have been a far, far drop from his presence in his kingdom. So his being humble is not about being born in a manger. His being humble is about taking flesh in the first place, no matter how regal that flesh might have been. Just by being contained in this body, in this way, is indicative of the truth of his love for us. It is undeniable. It is irrefutable that God loves us. Because why else would he do this? There is no other perception of a God in any other religion. An omnipotent divine being who takes the flesh of his creation and takes that form and lives with them to save them. It doesn't exist. And so the truth of that is in itself an absolute indication of his love for us. Pilate said, what is the truth? If we go on the path of this world, and if we look at everything being relative, the way we're taught, then God is relative. But how does that work? It, does that mean he is perfect sometimes and imperfect at others? That he loves sometimes and hates at others? How does that work? Surely if you are perfect, you are constant and consistent. You can't be relatively perfect. Because if you're relatively perfect, that's us. Because when we try to reach perfection, we actually reach relative perfection. The perfection we can reach. Going up and down at different times. And not being constant because we're not perfect. But he is perfect. And so therefore, he doesn't change. That's why in John 14, 6, our Lord says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know that Christians, before they were called Christians, were called those of the way. Those of the way. They had, they had a path. They, they had a track in their lives. They went down that path and they lived it. Psalm 119 verse 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth. The entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. So, when we look at the entirety of God's word, it is truth. The reason we sometimes don't see truth in God's word is we don't look at the entirety of it. We look at one bit of it. So, God, do you love me? Is that the truth, that you love me? Okay, well, why didn't you give me this? But hang on, th there's a bigger picture. There's an entirety of that truth. Why didn't I live this kind of life? 
And we take these, these instant snapshots at particular times of our lives and we make those the indicators. And we forget the whole picture of our lives. That's why it's important for us to remember this verse. The entirety of your word is truth. Your whole world together, your promise together, that is truth. Now, in postmodernist thought, we're told that everything is relative. A postmodern interpretation of religion or religious truth is that it is subjective, individualistic, and it depends on the person's point of view. So what I might consider truth, you wouldn't. And that's fine. That's fine because I might think that this room is now warm. Others of you sitting here would think it was cold because my body deals differently with temperature. And that is truth. So I, yes, I feel warm and you might feel cold. So of course that's relative. But that's because our bodies are different and temperature can be sensed differently. There is no consistency or continuity in it. But when we speak about the nature of God, God is the infinite, perfect, omnipotent being. He doesn't, he doesn't rely on our perception for being who he is. God is not a God who depends on whether I realize he's God or not, to be God. But it's a reality. It's a reality. Even if we go down the path of, of ethical relativism, ethically, some things are right, some things are wrong. Uh, if you talk about euthanasia, talk about abortion, if you speak about various kinds of, you know, life choices people make. Ethically, it's relative. And yes, again, it is relative until you test it against the word of God. Because as we read in Psalm 119, the entirety of your word is truth. So why is it that we would look at termination as being wrong, euthanasia as being wrong? Not because it's a certain situation, but because there's a sanctity of life. There's a respect to life. And so if there is a sanctity of life in one situation, then there's a sanctity of life across the board in its entirety. If there is a sacredness of relationship in one situation, then there is a sacredness of relationship across the board. It doesn't depend on who's doing what when. It's all the same. It is the entirety of that message. The biggest problem we have when we look at these relative perspectives is God is no longer part of it. It's just up to me. It's just up to my assessment. Remember earlier, when we spoke about not just making a decision based on our own personal interpretation. Of course, if we interpret scripture personally, everything is going to be relative because I will interpret it differently to all of you. And each one of you will interpret it differently to everybody else. But when God comes into the mix, when we look at God and the way he created us, we look at God's love for us, the way he created a sanctified life for us, once God is in the equation, things are no longer relative. They are true. Is life sanctified? Yes, it is a truth. 
Is it always sanctified? Yes. Is it sanctified if it's only a day old? Yes. Is it sanctified if it is riddled with sickness and prone to end any minute? Yes, it's always sanctified. So it's not relative anymore. Is a relationship sanctified? Yes. Must God be there? Yes. Is it in the view of the way he created humanity in Adam and Eve? Yes. Did he give us the ability and the honor of procreation in his creative perspective of us? Yes. So therefore, if I look at that, and if I look at relationships, whether they were 2,000 years ago, today, or in 2,000 years' time, does it matter what kind of social interaction we have in life? Is that what's going to assess whether relations should be heterosexual, homosexual, or whatever other strange deviations we're going to have as time goes on? Is it relative? No, because it ties into the entirety of God in the midst of all of that. That's why we say God is truth. And knowing that he is truth means that he's there for us and he becomes our benchmark. He becomes the, the measure with which we do things. In thinking in a godly way, there is an answer and there is a right answer. You see, we often confuse ourselves by thinking there's always more than one answer. And you've got to think about it and realize it and reflect on it. Sometimes there is only one answer. And it's a very simple answer. It may not be the answer people want to hear. It may not be what is fashionable. It may not be what is convenient. But there is an answer. And that answer doesn't change. Ephesians 4.14 says, We should no longer be as children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. Once God is in the equation, once that truth is there, we are no longer as children tossed to and fro. We're no longer brought to different things at different times and pushed in different directions because we don't know any better. How long will we continue to waver? How long will we continue to stray? How long will we doubt our own integrity? How long will we doubt the truth? Just because people don't agree with it does not mean it's not true. People have every right to disagree. I, as a person, have been on an incredible journey through my life. I've been brought up very much the same way as many of you have. I was raised in Australia, went back to Egypt, was in the monastery for six years, have been now in England for 20, and I've served in lots of different capacities. And that journey has pushed me far, far, far beyond any kind of comfort zone I ever had. And one thing I have learned throughout that journey is to respect and love everyone. Even if I thoroughly disagree with them. I can completely disagree. I can reject what they say and what they stand for. But I have learned to respect and love them. But at the same time, as I respect his or her right to have an opinion, I also hold very fast to my own. I'm not swayed by that. Being gracious does not mean being uncertain. It does not mean doubting ourselves. Sometimes we think that to be gracious means to always leave the door open just in case we're wrong. Now, I would go further than that. I would say being gracious means you test yourself to the absolute limit to make sure you're not wrong. And if there's the slightest doubt, 
then you keep testing yourself. But that does not apply to my confidence and knowledge in the presence of God. It doesn't apply to my understanding of the morality with which God expects us to live. Again, not for him, not because he is a manipulative, controlling, micromanaging being who gets his kicks out of playing chess with all of us. That's not who God is. The fact that God puts restrictions on our lives and tells us things is for our own good. We probably don't have much recollection of when we're one or two years of age. But I'm sure at some stage we would have been subject to these then hideous obstacles that are placed at the top of stairs. Because what you want is to walk out of your room now that you can walk. You want to walk out of your room. And have you ever seen an infant walking slowly? They don't walk slowly. The minute they start walking, it's because they're uncertain. They'll take steps, and then they'll think, OK, well, momentum is a good thing, although they don't understand momentum. But momentum is a good thing. And their heads are bigger than the rest of their body, so they're top heavy. right? That's just a reality. I don't mean to insult anyone. It's just a reality. It's the way we all created. We all looked like that at one stage. Some of us still look like that, but <laughs> it's a different issue. So because of that, they are propelled forward, and their little legs keep moving, and they think, OK, we're going to walk. And the walk turns into this uncertain, very fast stumble. Now, the first thing they want to do when they can do this is to get to the top of those stairs and then go down those stairs. And it is for that very reason that you have this hideous monstrosity of a gate that stops your freedom. They don't realize that that gate is probably what saves their lives. Just as we don't sometimes realize that whatever it is that God puts in our way, however undesirable it may appear there and then, is what saves our lives. But those restrictions are based on a God who knows all things and is perfect and doesn't change. And they're not really restrictions, they're safeguards. We just call them different things at different stages of our lives. And when we grow, and when you have your own children, and when they reach that age where they're you know, top-heavy and momentum and you know, stumble forward and all the rest of it, you will place a gate in their path. Not because you want to make their lives miserable, but because you want to safeguard them, and so on and so forth. And that's the way God deals with us. Again in Ephesians, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine and trickery of men. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So he is the desired result at the end. We want to grow into him. You know when, when little boys sort of want to grow and, up and be like their dads and girls want to be like their moms? That's exactly what we're hearing in Ephesians here. That we continue to grow into him. And why do we want to grow into him? Because the truth that he gives us is that he is perfection. And he calls us to that perfection. The truth in Christianity is directly related to our Lord Jesus Christ himself. We spoke earlier about people being benevolent. And we look at other faiths and other people 
and think there are lots of other people out there. There are lots of very good people out there. There are lots of faithful Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, atheists. What gives us a monopoly, a monopoly on what's right? What gives us the monopoly on truth? We're not comparing moral standing. We're not even comparing the life of people. We're not comparing how many better Hindus or Sikhs there are than, than good Christians. We're not comparing an ethical lifestyle. We're not comparing a benevolent choice. What we are speaking about is the reality of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. If we look at the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, from the beginning we read, Let not your heart, our Lord speaking to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. This is the whole plan. I have come to give you a message. I'm now going to go and prepare a place for you, and then I will come back and take you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will also be. It's not about the kind of life we live here. This is just a vehicle, it's a means to an end. To be a good Christian is not just about the life we live here. We live the life we live here because we want to be like our God, like our Creator, like our Master. We want to be good disciples to a divine teacher. What it is about is about what comes later that we may be where he is. He goes on to say, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. But this confused the disciples. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? The disciples with all the love and respect in, in the world for them, and I risk saying these things because I don't ever mean to condemn saints, but they didn't always start as the most shrewd, th I'm trying to be very polite here. <laughs> they didn't always start being the most perceptive. So here we are talking about where we're going and our Lord says, and you know where I'm going, you know the way. And so St. Thomas turns around and says, we don't know where you're going. So if we don't know where we're going, how do we know the way? And, and you can almost see our Lord taking a deep breath saying, okay, don't react, don't react, don't react. It's okay, they're only human. And I made them this way anyway, so I can't really blame them. <laughs> if I wanted them all to be super intelligent, I suppose I would have done that. But then again, it wouldn't have been so much fun. <laughs> and our Lord looks at him, and you can either have two scenarios in your head, sort of a very gentle, fatherly, teacher to disciple look saying I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me or you could have looked and said listen I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me now whichever scenario you have in your head it's totally up to you but they both lead to the same thing there is no reaching God, salvation, the kingdom, without 
accepting the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ as the incarnate word and our Savior. That's what it comes down to. The truth is not about benevolence or goodness. That's not what it is. The truth is about him being the incarnate word and our Savior. And that's why we're baptizing. And most people here would have been baptized as infants. Some of you may have been baptized as adults. But those who are baptized as infants wouldn't remember that when you were baptized, your mother probably carried you and made a promise on your behalf, a pledge that not only would she bring you up in the church, in the love of God, in the understanding of the Trinity, but made a very clear admission that she believed that our Lord Jesus Christ was the incarnate word and was God. And believed that salvation only came through him and through his baptism. Now, in a relativist world where there is this hypersensitivity to exclusion because no one should ever be excluded from ever, anything. And that, that's great. That, that, that is wonderful because we believe that no one should be disadvantaged. But within this hypersensitivity to exclusion or alienation, we're not excluding or alienating anyone from saying this is our truth. We're not excluding or alienating anyone from saying the truth is that God loves us so much that he came and took flesh to save us. So if you want salvation in him, you need to believe in him. We're not saying, no, 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 you can't be saved. We're saying that God calls the whole of humanity to salvation. Everybody. Your friends who are of other religions and other faiths or of no faith at all. He calls you and them and the whole of humanity throughout the whole of history to salvation. But we need to believe. We sometimes feel um, very uncomfortable with that idea. It's almost like being exclusive. It's not exclusive at all. It's just saying, for us, the kingdom of God is to be with God forever. It's joy in him there. Now, if someone doesn't believe in our Lord Jesus Christ as the incarnate word, as God, why would he or she want to spend eternity with him? It's not about being exclusive. It's about saying, make a choice. What do you believe in? What do you want to believe in? This is my truth. This is my truth. I love you. I respect you. I, I, I admire you. I, I like the way you do certain things in your life. I may disagree with certain things, but I like others. But my truth, my reality, is that my Lord, Jesus Christ, is my Savior. And as I was saying earlier, don't ever give up your right to make and declare that choice. There are people in the world today who die so that they can proclaim this truth. There are people in the world today who are asked to reject Christ or they will die and they choose to die because they will never denounce him. So don't give up your right in places in the world where we are told we have every right to believe what we want to believe. Don't let a world agenda that is trying to push us all to this homogenous gray matter of existence where everyone's the same, believing the same thing, having this postmodernist spiritualist ideology that says, you are okay, we're all fine, we're all good, just believe in what you want. And that's fine, but it then says, because it's all the same at the end, but it's not. Don't give up your right in that context to say, I believe in the truth. And I, I'm not excluding you, I'm not pushing you away, I'm saying to you, this truth is open to everyone. You are 
totally within your right to reject it. But you are also totally within your entitlement to accept it and make it your truth as well. In order to know the truth, we need to follow our Lord's teaching example. John 8, 31, 32, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But that means we have to abide. We, we often don't abide in his word. We have fleeting journeys in his word. We have a drive-by in his word. We sort of visit his word occasionally. But we don't abide in his word. To reach the truth, we need to abide in his word. We need to live. I don't know if you know what the word abide means. We hear it all the time. Um, the best way to explain it is if you've, if you've heard of, you know, when you're, when you're filling out a form, if someone's using a little bit older language, they'll ask you for your place of abode. It's just where you live. So where you abide is where you live. Live in his word. Don't just have fleeting experiences. Don't just drive by it. Don't look at it from a distance. Live in his word. And once you live in his word and you abide in that word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But hang on. We sometimes feel that abiding in his word is actually a restraint. It means I need to do the right thing. It needs to be, I, need to, I need to be moral. I need to be ethical. I need to make these choices. And it's almost a burden. But it's not. It actually sets us free. Imagine. Imagine a world where if someone at work, a colleague comes to you and says, have you seen X? Imagine a world where you could just simply say yes or no, rather than have to think of the political implications of saying yes and saying no, and what is a white line, what is a red line, what is a black line, and if I'm going to say this, what's, how does it affect that person, and should I say yes or should I say no, should I just say no this time and then go and confess to Abuna because that's just what I do, is my lie justified? If I just lived in this perfect world where I abide in his word, I live in his word all the time, and so therefore, let your yes be yes, let your no be no, I can just say yes or no, is that not freedom? Doesn't that take a huge weight off our shoulders? If I were to able to, to Proclaim my faith in the way I want. To just be the person I want to be. Rather than looking at all these social constraints and restraints of how I'm going to be accepted or rejected, wouldn't that set us free? Imagine that. And that's why he says, when you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But there's a restraint to that freedom. And that is that Satan wants to break us down. Satan wants to, to take away that joy from us. He wants to make us uncertain. He wants to take away the certainty of the love of God in our lives. He wants to take away the certainty of the fact that we are valued by God. And he wants to constantly keep us within this uncertain loop. Because you know what? If you are constantly trying to stay just out of trouble, then you're never going to reach righteousness. And that's the problem we live sometimes. We sometimes get into this loop of, um, I'm trying not to sin, therefore I'm trying not to do this. And so therefore I'll try harder and I'll fall into sin and then I go confess and I become better and I try not to sin again and become that loop. And so it becomes a cycle 
rather than a spiral of overcoming sin, moving to the next step, overcoming sin, moving to the next step, ascending very gradually until I reach the pinnacle of righteousness. I'm always hovering down here. And if Satan keeps me hovering down here, then that's the best thing for him. Because then I can't even focus on truth or righteousness. I'm just trying to stay out of trouble. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm not even thinking of becoming better or ascending or improving. I'm just trying to keep my head above water down here. The Gospel of St. John, speaking of Satan, we hear he was a murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. So he is the exact opposite of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and life. He is the way, the truth, and life here. Satan has no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is the liar and the father of it. That's who Satan is. And that's where we suddenly get the presence of sin. It makes us uncertain, takes away our stability in our lives. But when Satan makes us doubt, because there will be situations in our lives where we start to doubt. When Satan makes us doubt, each and every one of us, think about what I said earlier to do with the certainty and the stability and the consistency of God. And see if that fits. Like I said, don't just take a snapshot of your life and judge God on that. Look at the entirety of it. John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. John 6.40, this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son of Man and believes in him may have everlasting life. Hebrews 13.5, he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you read those, how can you then doubt God, even if Satan places all the doubt in the world in our minds? Just the fact that he puts doubt in our minds does not change the truth. Just because there's sin in the world, just because there's temptation in the world, just because there are obstacles placed by him, does not mean that God is not the truth. St. John Chrysostom says, God loves us more than father, mother, friend, or anyone else can love. And even more than we are able to love ourselves. We sometimes reject God because we think that we're protecting ourselves. But his love for us is so perfect that it exceeds even our love for ourselves. Because he is perfect and knows all things. We are limited and mortal, and our view of life is very limited. So in all of this, these verses, along with this exposition from John, St. John Chrysostom, does that sound like a God who wants to cause us pain? Yes, there's pain in the world. But does it sound like a God who wants to cause us pain? Who goes out of his way to cause us pain? Of course not. He's actually there that we may have life and have it more abundantly. He's there to save us from the pain when it comes. To say that our Lord is the light of the world. If this whole room becomes dark and someone comes in with a candle, that candle was not the cause of darkness. It is here to break the darkness. Just as our Lord coming into the world was there to break our darkness. And to give us hope that, as we read in John 16.33, in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. 
In the world you'll have darkness, in the way you'll have challenge, in the world you'll have so much that stands against you, in the world you'll have obstacles to your joy, in the world you will feel that you are imperfect. You will feel that you are less than worthy. You will feel unable to push against everything that comes up in your way. In the world you will have tribulation. But then our Lord reassures us and said, you know what? Yes, you will. It's there because Satan wants to deceive you. I didn't place it there, but he places it in your way. He tries to distract you. He tries to obstruct you. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So if you stay with me, you will overcome the you will overcome the same world through me. And that's the only way we can journey in life. With him. It's like going through a very hostile terrain where the weather may be horrible outside, but you're in a vehicle being driven through this terrain that keeps you safe. We speak about our churches being the ship of salvation, where we're all journeying through the storms of the world in the ship of salvation with our Lord steering it and taking us to a safe harbor. So yes, in the world you'll have storms around you, you'll have tribulations, but our Lord says, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. <coughs> Jeremiah 29.13 says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So if we are searching for the truth and we search with all our hearts, if we really seek him, we're going to find him because that's a promise God makes. God doesn't make promises he doesn't keep. He says to us, seek and you will find. Knock and it will be answered. Ask, it will be given. And here he says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now that's the problem. We sometimes don't find the truth and don't find him because we are not seeking with all our hearts. We're seeking with part of our lives. The part we can put aside, the part we can set aside, the part we can sacrifice. Lord, you know, the rest of my life is really full. I've got my family, I've got my work, I've got my friends, I've got my commitments. I've got all of these things. But you know what? I, I can't give you all of my heart. But I'm still perplexed why I can't find you. The answer is because until you search for me with all of your heart, you're not going to find me. You will still keep seeking the truth and you won't find it because the truth is not relative. The truth only is, is only there when you seek it in its entirety. You can't just pick and choose the truth. You either want the truth or you don't. You either find the truth or you don't. You either live the truth or you don't. You can't take it in small portions. And I want to close with a, with a passage from St. Isaac the Syrian, who says, The soul that loves God has its rest in God and God alone. In all the paths that men walk in the world, they do not attain peace until they draw close to hope in God. So, we can journey, but we are not going to find rest until we find rest in Him. And until we draw close to Him, things will always be relative. Things will be a matter of speculation, uncertain. But when we come close to Him and seek Him and find Him, because we have sought Him with all of our hearts, then, and only then, will we draw 
hope from him and live in the truth that only comes in him and through him. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Just take a moment to reflect on that, please.